thank you for coming. This is New Faces of Media Justice. And uh, um, and my name is Leela Kataev. I'm here from Real Girls. And um, we'll be introducing everybody in just a moment. Everyone's going to have a few minutes to chat. But this is really a hands-on workshop. So I know it's early in the morning, but I hope you guys are ready to get moving and do some activities with us. So that's what we're really excited to do with you today. Um, so just getting started, I, I think everyone has gotten a chance to participate. This is something we do at Real Girls a lot. Just call it a around the world question activity. And um, it gives us an opportunity to get our youth just thinking about um, different questions we're going to be exploring together in our workshops. So um, right away they're thinking about issues that are important to them. Um, so that's kind of in their head. Um, talking about the media, different questions about the media. And uh, later on when we are doing our breakouts and you have some time to kind of look around the room, it'd be a really good time to check out the questions. Um, normally we'll check back in later in the workshop um, with our real girls and, and they'll have a chance to look at those questions, see what we've kind of answered together and what they still have questions about. Um, so I'm just going to start out by saying a few words about real girls and then I'll introduce our first speaker. Um, so Real Girls is a youth media organization in Seattle, Washington, and we teach media literacy and filmmaking to teenage girls. We work with girls ages 9 to 19. We've recently gone down to the 9 to 12 year olds because they were really asking for it. Um, and uh, we do a variety of different stuff throughout the year. We do short workshops, uh, weekend long or a week long, um, and then we do several month long programs that meet every week after school and on some Saturdays. So we really try to give them professional filmmaking skills, um, give them time to really do story development and explore some issues that are important to them. Um, and then they come out of it making films that we do submit to festivals all over the world and a lot of them do really well. So um, it's a great experience for them. And um, I wanna go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Sam Yolenberg, who was a Real Girls graduate just a couple years back. Hey guys, I'm Sam, and um, I started doing Real Girls in my freshman year of high school, so about six years ago, and if you're ever in Seattle, it's a great organization. Um, I wasn't even really interested in filmmaking when I started, it just kind of happened, and I mean, I'm a film student at NYU now, so obviously I'm kind of stuck with it. Um, today, what I want to talk about mostly about is a film that I made with Real Girls my junior year of high school. And while I had made other films in the past, I hadn't really done any that focused on media literacy before. So this was kind of my first experience as a youth. I was, I guess, probably 17 then, um, trying to understand issues of media literacy and media justice and also educating my peers about it and I really wanted to create a piece that was for a peer audience um, that addressed some of these issues about media ownership and how youth are represented in the media but then also looking at some of the ownership and structural issues that make it so maybe we're not represented how we want to be. So the whole documentary is about 10 minutes long, we're not going to watch all of it but I at least want to show you guys the youth section of it. So you can see um, some of the youth perspectives that I include in the piece. The future well-being of the entire nation is at stake. It sounds cliche, but it's really true that we, the youth, are the future of the world. I experienced firsthandedly the godlike influence the current media has on young people of the nation. I watch TV and the news and um, mostly internet and stuff like that. So I watch a lot of news like and screws like MSNBC. Does magazines count? Mag I read magazines all the time. I watch a lot of TV, pretty much whatever it's on, like whatever shows in. So often teenagers are um, are seen as people who only see one side to an issue, who um, aren't fully informed. Teenagers are shown like they're using a lot of drugs, they're drinking and all this stuff. I'm represented as a, as the girl who's pretty much getting pregnant at the age of 15, because that's pretty much how I've seen it in the TV, like, oh, she's pregnant, she's Latina. People think I'm, like, really gangster and all that, but I'm not. It's, I don't know. Basically, um, it makes really, really bad appearance of teenagers in, the modern, in modern society. After the 9-11 happened, I believe that people viewed 
the Islam nation as a terrorist. I'm misrepresented a lot more than you know I, I was back then in 2000. And if you see right now, a lot of people when you walk on the street, you know, they, whatever they see from the news, they hear from the news, they put you, they point fingers towards you, and a lot of it's stereotypes. Like terrorists, and guns, and like they put like this clothes on, and I don't know. That's not basically like how I dress or like how I act. We had a protest last year and we were walking by showing people that we're not terrorists. Most people were like, you know, giving us the middle finger and telling us to get out, you know, to get out of the country, go back to where you came from. I really thought it was important for me as um, a youth to testify because even though there's all those adults there who are representing us, I wanted to tell them something that only a young person would tell them. Media literacy and media justice is something that youth are thinking about and something that we are thinking about. So I think it's really important whenever you're working with youth in your organizations to engage this kind of curriculum because uh, we're aware how we are represented in the media. And so then getting the education about the FCC and some of the structural powers um, is really useful because then it um, helps form a higher critique and also and be embedded within um, just encouraging you to create their own media. So if you're looking at, um, you know, we don't like how we're represented, this is who's representing us, and so we're going to represent ourselves. I think it's a really great structure to have in youth media work. Cool. Thanks, guys. Hi, um, my name is Shavella. And I'm a 17-year-old junior at Boston Latin Academy. Um, I'm a part of two programs, actually. The ICA, which is the Institute of Contemporary Art. I'm part of their Fast Forward program, which is a video production program that lasts year round. And also Girls Radio, who's here right now. <laughs> They're a, we're a web-based um, radio station um, in Upham's Corner. And we'll start with ICA. First, it's um, a year-round program that anybody can get into for teenagers. And um, this is actually my second year in the program. And pretty much we make videos about anything. Some kids come in and make these, like, hilarious videos about nothing. Some kids come in and make documentaries about things that are actually important to them. Last year, my video, um, it sort of showed the contrast in Boston and sort of the social and economic contrast. And I'll just show a piece of that. And it's to uh, one of my friend's songs. Also leads into girls radio um, which 
this is the website if you want to listen to it Monday through Friday. Um, so the model is actually where girls are heard and respected. So girls radio is just all girls and um, we go on air Monday through Friday and pretty much talk about whatever we want to talk about, whatever we think is important in our lives and what affects us. So I think we interview people, there's Mayor Menino, um, we've interviewed like a judge and even um, a singer from New Kids on the Block. So we sort of talk about anything. And I just think it's really important for teens to be able to speak and to have a voice in the community. My name is Kara Lisa Burke Powers. I have a lot of names. Uh, and I'm co-director of Press Pass TV. And we're a youth media organization here in Boston. And what we do is we work we were founded, really, to for a lot of the same reasons that Girls Radio exists, which is that most of the media in Boston and in every city um, that talks about young people and talks about especially communities of color and low-income communities has a really deficit-based focus and talks about poverty and talks about drugs and talks about teen pregnancy and glamorizes violence. Uh, but doesn't talk about all the really amazing things that young people like the, like the girls at Girls Radio are doing. Uh, and so Press Pass TV was really started to highlight some of those really amazing stories that were not being told. And as we've grown and as we've evolved, we've really become a capacity building organization to help young people tell their own stories about the amazing work that they're doing. And so now we work primarily with youth organizing groups like the Boston Area Youth Organizing Project, who are our hosts here in Boston. We have a uh, space in their office um, in the Roxbury Environmental Empowerment Project, Sociedad Latina, all kinds of organizations that we work with their youth to help them tell effective stories about the campaigns that they're working on for change. Um, one thing I wanna say from, from a more academic perspective is that the problems that Sammy's video covers and the problems that Chevelle is talking about are not new since adolescence has been invented, since, um, since teenagers as a term were coined when the baby boomers were teenagers, this has been a persistent theme in the media, in the dominant dialogue in our culture, that youth are a problem to be dealt with and not really the future that we expect them to be suddenly when they become adults, we're like, here, now lead. Um, we don't do the hard work to make sure that they're ready for that and to make sure that we're giving them voices now um, which I think is really critical if we're going to think about what our next steps are. We need to be listening to, uh, to young people because they do have solutions now. So um, I am going to share with you. So this is our, our website, and it really is a portal to all of our content. And our most recent video um, is about, as any of the young ladies who are in Boston Public Schools in here can tell you, um, they're doing a lot of closing of schools. We're not, we're not at 60 students like Detroit yet, but we have heard some really, really high numbers. Um, and they just voted to close and consolidate 16 more schools. And so this video is really about the young people's response to that. A lot of them walked out of school. Um, and unfortunately, we're not listened to by the people who have the power to make a change in that. Why you united will never be defeated. Why you united will never be defeated. Students from several youth organizations gathered Wednesday to protest closures and reorganization measures being taken by the Boston School Committee to balance their budget. The city school working and closing in predominantly black neighborhoods. Now I think that's, I think that's a big problem. Students waited outside the Boston Public Schools headquarters for over an hour before adult allies were able to help ensure the student voices could be heard. Uh, what we did is we told them this is unacceptable. So there was a long negotiation. Sam and Rena came back and said, five minutes time, you'll be allowed to Once inside, students waited patiently for their turn to speak, holding signs while they listened to the Chief Financial Officer's report. They were frustrated, though, at their two-minute speaking limits and what they perceived as a lack of consideration for youth voice. I have not considered the feelings of, of us, the youth, 
feather sitting here making decisions that's going to affect others every single day. which will next go before the city council. Reports Thursday morning insinuated that the youth protesters were manipulated by adults with political agendas. The students who prepared all week for the protest resented these accusations. What I mean. And we're just, we're not for it right now. So we're marching and making some noise because talk is cheap. You know, we go to school committee meetings and we talk and have long conversations about what we think and all this stuff and nothing ever changes. But when, when the media does something, they flip it and say that the students are being rebellious, but they never say that the students are empowering themselves and are, are fighting for their education, so the media is not doing a good job. We, want the, we basically want our voices heard on this situation because it's affecting a lot of the youth, and especially uh, it's going to affect more of the younger youth, not, especially not us because we're basically out of here. So we just want our voices to be heard. The, that's the kind of work that um, that we do, and some of the pieces of that um, will hopefully help bring to some of you guys today. Cool. So um, now we're going to go ahead and jump into the kind of action part of our workshop. So just to let you know how it's going to go for uh, the next hour of our workshop, we're going to split up into small groups and have each of you um, pick out of our activity grab bag. And uh, so each group is going to have a chance to do a, a short activity that explores some of these issues we're talking about. Uh, and then we'll have a report back portion after that so we can share with each other what worked about the activities and what we might want to bring to the work that we do. Um, and then we'll, we'll leave plenty of time for a Q&A at the end. So that's the plan. And um, let me just take a quick look at how many people we have here. Okay, so we're going to try for five groups of five, and um, let's see, we can just kind of break off based on where we are, or do you guys want to count off? What do you think? We're super organized. Okay, we're going we're gonna to just kind of break off, um, so find the five people around you, kind of um, bring yourself to a corner of the room if you can, um, and we're going to come around with the grab bag and give you the activities and give you about half an hour to work through it, okay? We're going to start on the share back, and we're actually going to start with this group. So if you just answer those three questions, or have a representative answer those three questions. Three to five movies we've seen that have at least two women in them that are um, have names that talk to each other about something other than a man. So we went around the room. Um, first, we listed movies we've seen, and then we had to rate them on based on this test, and out of each of us coming up with three movies apiece, so out of all of that, we only came up with one movie each that passed the test. Um, and yeah, so out of 15 movies, there were only five of them that passed the test. This is really loud. I do not like microphones. Um, and so, did you raise your hand? Oh, okay. So then we did that, and we talked about that, and then the next thing we did was to 
try and um, kind of shift the test to apply it to something else other than women. So we did, um, what was the thing we did? My mind is gone now. Young Women in Reality TV. So we came up with questions about, are there, is there reality TV shows on right now that represent young women who are in the, who are in the show that do not have physical confrontation with one another? And it was really hard to come up with a lot of shows that there's not a physical, or the threat of some kind of violence to each other on reality TV shows. And then we also applied it to senior citizens. Are there senior citizens, um, two or more senior citizens in TV that um, are not that you know are not senile and don't have some kind of medical issue that they were always talking about, and that was really hard too. I mean, we went all the way back to like thinking about the Cosby Show, you know, because I mean, yeah, Stanford and Sunny. <laughs> and we questioned Grady's character a little bit though, because he was a little senile. But anyway, so clearly, clearly that we we saw that there are a lot of movies out there that. Um, or men are the main characters, there's lots of men in the movies, and if there are women in the movies, they don't either talk to each other, and if they do talk to each other, they're talking about a man. So, we need to do something about that. And the last question, yeah. how, can how can we use this activity with youth in our communities? I mean, I think the reality TV one is a good one, because you can watch a lot of reality TV. I watch a lot of reality TV, so I could have that discussion. Um, we kind of do have those discussions about how people act in reality TV, whether it's funny or not, you know, that type of thing, but I think you can apply it and get youth to really think about um, kind of what they're watching and the impact it's having on them, on the community, on others, so. Thank you. So, what we had to do was use a teaching and action guide worksheet. Um, basically, it says, what's the name of your video, so once you use a video, but we chose to use a song and basically analyze it so Miranda's going to tell you exactly what we did. Okay, so we looked up the video SNM S &M by Rihanna. Everybody seen that video? Heard of it? Okay, um, basically it's her dressed up sexually and part of the dominatrix. And one of the long, some lines in the song is sex in the air. I don't care, I like the smell of it. And we basically talked about how it's censored, we should censorship it, like in the media, and the images that she shows that it's fun for women to do because she makes it seem like it's um, the cool thing to do and it's playful and it's just not. Um, then we talked about the sexuality that it is in the media and how like she has a newspaper in the background and it says like slut, whore, and then she has um, her whipping chains and people tied up and everything like that. Um, we decided, how can we use this? We can use it in the community, basically what I just said, to show that a negative side of it and then, which is the video and then a positive side and how to like change it around and show them like, this is not the way to go because back in the day, it would be not cool to do it. Like, not a lot of people would know that you're doing this, but now she makes it seem like it's okay. So that's it. Thank you. Great. So I'm gonna have a co-host in case I miss something. Um, so our group, uh, watched a recent episode of The Simpsons. If you raise your hands and they're like vaguely familiar with so like the characters of The Simpsons, go use some names of characters and they'll just for expedience. So Mr. Burns um, is presumed dead and gets a horrible obituary critiquing him and all his horrible uh, corporate uh, machinations, what have you. And so he sets out to rehabilitate this image by buying up all of the media in town. And uh, there's you know, a conflict between his corporate media and Lisa, character who creates her own newsletter to try and get the, the voice of the community out, and ends up inspiring other community members to do the same. So we had four questions we were going to answer. So you want to help? Uh, well, you answered the first one, which was why Mr. Burns wanted to own the media. Um, and, uh, how Lisa and her community organized to keep their voices in the media, um, which is basically resorting to archaic technology 
um, to make to get their voices out um, since Burns controls utilities and um, media outlets. Uh, our third question was who creates the media in our community? Um, and the consensus was in addition to the mainstream outlets there you know there are a lot of independent outlets even though people aren't aware of them. Um, so it could be the person sitting next to you who's, who's creating the media. Um, and if we had a paper like Lisa's, uh, the issues that we would want to talk about uh, were education, um, curriculum, policy, and internet was the other one? program in Baltimore and we're always looking for kind of like things that are I think attractive and engaging to young people like you know initially I think looking at the Simpsons or a piece of pop culture like that can be like a way to kind of sneak in some higher uh, concept media literacy uh, criticism and things like that so I think like everything I've heard um, in these episodes I think are like really good quick exercises to get people like looking more critically at the media landscape around them that's really helpful for at least an organization like mine that's working with young people. PSA, and we decided to use our good friends here. Um, her organization is, do you wanna? The Center for Sustainable and Just Communities, and it's in Baltimore, and we thought it'd be the best to create a PSA around. read through our packet and we figured out what it takes to make a PSA and we first had to find what we wanted the PSA to be about and the only one that really had a focused organization was the Center for and then we had a focus on an audience and we just focused basically on anyone who would want to donate flip cams and, and or funds. And what we talked about was how a digital diary would help these youths that come out of a detention center and how documenting their experiences will further help the center to help them. And how we can use this in our activity with youth in our communities. Um, I feel that digital diaries could be very important. I feel as a youth myself that by sharing my experiences, it gets other people to share their experiences. And it makes it even easier when you see a young person like yourself sharing that experience. And I feel that if we could get more people to make digital diaries and to just put their beliefs and their lives out there, just it just opened the youth community even more. So, 
I hope you guys enjoyed the activities and will be able to use these activities and similar ones in your communities and in your work with youth. Um, now we are all done with the formal programming, so we just want to open it up to a Q&A. And also we're going to pass around um, a sign-in sheet. So if you want more information about our organizations and our work, or if you just want to keep in contact and ask us more questions, um, please sign the list. But yeah. Are you going to like disseminate the, the contacts to everybody? To everybody, just the three organizations. Does anybody want that, or, you know, to have each other's contact info? Oh, within the room. Right. We'd also, um, we had talked about doing the sign up so that we could distribute resources. So like if any of you feel like you want um, the write up that of some of the activities that we did today, maybe the ones that you weren't in, um, or if you want any more resources for um, other organizations that you can use to get curriculum from, that's something we can we can give you if, um, if you want to sign up for more resources. And we can also just open it up for discussion if people don't have questions. We just really wanted to leave a lot of time for a conversation. So um, we do have a mic, or we can just keep it intimate. <laughs> so actually, this was the question I put on the paper. And I want to take a lot of what I've learned over this past weekend back to my own high school. And I want to know how I would start a youth media program at my own high school. We are small right now, but we continue to get larger each year. And I feel that we have a lot of brilliant minds who would love to produce media and, and even maybe make a television show for my school. Or Just where do you think I should start? I would say that if you want to start something specifically at your high school, that that starting at like a, a regular club is a good way to start. Um, and maybe starting from that media literacy perspective and building, so um, so in my, in my book we talk about sort of a five step process and there's consume. So a lot of, not just young people, everybody, we all have, we have our phones, we have our computers and we're not watching media together. So a good way to start is to start doing that and talking about it. Um, and then learning about some of the skills like grant writing, um, get a teacher to help you out, and, and try to get some equipment if you don't already have some. Um, given that we're fairly local, I'm also happy to, to try to set you up with some resources um, here locally that, that might be connected. You might, some Southern New Hampshire might even be better for you guys as far as trying to get some equipment there. Um, and really, you know, if you can get a little group together to start doing stuff and then, you know, um, Flipcam has like a nonprofit um, program where it's a little bit cheaper to get cameras, starting out with some smaller things like that. Um, and there's lots of really great resources around curriculum for teaching you how to make different videos and things like that. Um, and we can send out some of those resources to the listserv. Current TV has some great tutorials online. Media That Matters Festival has a lot of really great videos from youth producers and adult producers about different social justice issues, which, um, which is really great. So, uh, and I think that there's a, a really vibrant youth media community already in Massachusetts that we can help to tap you into. What was the first organization you mentioned before, Media That Matters? Current TV has a lot of online tutorials. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would also just mention um, that uh, you've already started to talk a little bit about doing media literacy activities together, but I think people who are just starting out to make media, it's really tempting to just like, yeah, let's grab the camera, let's do it, you know, and the more time that you spend sort of figuring out exactly what you want to say and, and planning, you know, pre-production as much as you can sort of figure out together, especially if you're going to make a, a group project, you're just gonna see that, re you know, you're gonna reap the rewards when you actually make the movies or make the TV show. So, that's awesome. Thank you, Dia. <laughs> yeah. uh, so how long, how long would it take to make like a half an hour TV show? Like how, how long in filming and how long in editing? 
Don't forget, I mean, aside from the planning, sorry, it's after that. It's the actual production there. Do you want to jump in? Well, I mean, it really depends. I guess, in theory, it could take 30 minutes if you're just recording it. Um, Generation of Consolidation, that video I made, I spent an entire school year on, um, after school and almost every day towards the last two months, right? That's only 10 minutes. And that's only 10 minutes long, so I guess multiply that by three. So it really depends, and it depends if, you know, if you're doing something like video blogging, that's something you can just sit down at your computer um, and maybe have an outline in front of you and just start talking. Whereas if you're doing more of an edit documentary, it's gonna take more time. So you kind of have to figure out with what you think will be best for your message and for your audience. Um, it also depends on like, how many people are working on your project and sort of how clean cut and how much animation and stuff you wanna put into it. Like my piece, it also took like a school year just because I was jumping around a lot and there were a lot of different things to film as opposed to just one, like sitting in a room and like recording one thing and editing just that. So it mostly depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah, I just want to chime in another example. Um, the program I facilitate at a wide angle youth media in Baltimore, I work with 12 high school students for a full academic year to go through all the technical training, um, like some people have never really used camera for, all the way through right in the semester, finishing about 30 minutes, about 35 minutes of finished content that can go out to festivals and can go on public access, things like that. And it really, we meet once or twice a week for two hours at a time um, throughout um, October through May to finish everything. And I think in terms of like programming costs, I think it really, it's about five hundred to a thousand dollars a minute of finished content. That's because we're doing a lot of education at the same time. So it also depends on whether you have people that are ready to hop in and make something, or whether you really need to do a lot of training and technical learning and, and academic learning about film and media literacy and things like that, and how rich that programming is, or whether you're hopping in and just doing something down and dirty and quick and getting something made. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, really, the tech training that takes the longest from working with people who haven't done video before, or radio, or whatever. The, I cannot overemphasize the importance of effective storytelling. So the technical training is super important, especially like things that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Like there's nothing behind me, so it's gonna look like I'm right up against the wall. Um, but being able to tell a really good story also has to be part of the training, regardless of what kind of story you're telling, whether it's documentary or, or fictional narrative. Um, Otherwise, you're all, it can look really good, but it might not say anything. Any other questions, comments, or thoughts about what we did today? <laughs> I think the, uh, the exercise all the exercises were great because they really make you think. And I know when we were doing ours, I didn't think it would be that difficult to think of a movie that had two or more women that talked to each other and, then, and had names and talked to each other about something other than men. So I think that was excellent, especially for high school students because that's when you're forming uh, who you are and what's really important in your life. And it, I think it's a really good thing because if you just watch TV and movies, it seems that the most important thing is a man. And it's really not. And I think it's, it's never too early to talk about that and get that firmly in your mind that you are important and you are beautiful and you don't have to be penciled in and all those things that we see in the, in, in the media the way women are portrayed. So I thought that was great. And I really admire you guys for the work that you're doing. And it's just excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also kind of just to respond to what you said about um, how women are portrayed in the media, that's a lot of what we do at Girls Radio is sort of doing workshops to kids. Like, I think between 9 and 18, we talk to them about how people portray the media and if this is what they're really like. And we just talk a lot about that, like music, TV shows, so.
collections that we do, the workshops, and this opened my mind a little bit more how we can expand the curriculum and zero in on certain things instead of just taking every single thing and really talking about that one thing, you know. So it helped me to broaden the curriculum and hopefully change up how we do things just a little bit. Um, and, you know, this, we really wanted to talk in this workshop about bringing social justice, media justice issues into youth media work. Um, if you, you know, kind of infuse that into the, the uh, curriculum that you're teaching, um, or, you know, if, if you're young people and you're wanting to just learn about it yourself, you know, maybe you won't necessarily want to make a movie about those exact issues, and that's okay. I mean, it, it's, it's really the process of starting to think about those issues, and then, thinking about creating your own media that, you know, just sort of flips it from the mainstream. So that's kind of what we all wanted to just get together and talk about. So I hope you guys got that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments before we break? What, what would be, if you could say like the one to three, like things that have the lowest barrier to overcome where people can just jump in and get started. If there's like a little group, a youth group, and they want to get started doing some, uh, you know, like TV blogging or uh, YouTube, you know, whatever, like where can they jump in? You mean equipment wise? Like uh, well, anything, anything you think of, you know, that would make it easy to just like start something up that could, you know, could grow. Direction, equipment, the process, you know, whatever, channels, outlets. Well, I'm not sure if this exactly like answers what you're saying, but last year, well, was it last summer, um, there was a team convening at the ICA for museums all around like the nation. We sort of talked about how teens can get involved in like museums and sort of talk about social justice issues and how we can get like resources from them and so like equipment and all that stuff from them. And I think mainly it's just sort of finding somewhere where you can get everything you need to just start off. So like the ICA, they have like a million classes that anybody can sort of join at any point in the year. And I think that's like a really big thing. I think actually museums around like the nation have a lot of just different programs that teens can get involved in to start off. Um, I would say that one of the lowest barrier to entry things is probably blogging. And if there was like a group of youth, you'd easily create a multi-user blog on WordPress that to sort of get started. But also, um, there are community access stations in in many communities, even ones that are are underserved by a lot of mainstream media, and a lot of them do have youth programs, and that's a really underutilized resource, especially because we do want community access to be a voice of the people, and even there, young people are sort of underrepresented, and so that, that would be another thing, because that kind of like a half hour, sort of almost like public affairs type program is pretty easy to, like Sammy said, if you're just going to film the 30 minutes, the planning takes, you know, you might spend a week writing your content, deciding what you're going to talk about, but it takes about a half an hour and then it might play a couple times during that week. So I would say blogging and then also a really simple format TV show on a public access station would sort of be two things that are pretty easy to, to get started on. Something to add to in terms of equipment, like if you're looking at just trying to step up, um, you know, working with equipment that you have or that you want to try to get your hands on, Two things that just step it up a little bit from the amateur level is like a tripod and an external mic. Like even if they're totally cheap, those will just kind of elevate your media so much. Just having a steady shot and having audio that you can hear. Those those are key. Yeah. Um, aside from like independent youth media <clears throat> projects, I work for a newspaper in Boston and All Weekly, and I think it would be great if a newspaper like the one that I work for were to do some sort of like 
collaboration with a high school or something. I was like, or to have like a high school page or high school blog or something. And I was wondering if you guys have seen anyone doing that effectively. Um, any examples of like pre-existing publications collaborating with you? I know actually the Boston Globe, they have a section where my friend, I think uh, students can intern and they write actually articles for them. High school interns? Yeah, high school interns. And it's in, they have like their own pretty much um, newspaper for it. Uh, uh, I'll also add, do you know that the Phoenix has featured our content on the Phoenix blog, which is super exciting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that, that Teens in Print is a great example um, I think that something with um, something with something more like an alt weekly, like the Phoenix or the Dig, might have a little bit more. And if you partner with an organization that's really got a strong positive youth development focus, could have a little bit more um, reach beyond sort of the the safe topics that tend to get covered and things that are sponsored by more something more like the Globe. I think um, it's a great idea, and I think we often think of youth media as this like separate sector, but it is important to integrate youth work into the kind of all of our media making, and especially starting out in Real Girls at High School, some of the most valuable experiences I had there were the chance to collaborate and kind of learn and teach these um, older mentors, and it's kind of this cross-generational learning. And so I think not just having your youth sector, but having your youth working within your organizations is always a great idea. And then I guess Leela will say a few closing words, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, I just, I was asked to just make sure you guys all know that the closing plenary is starting in about half hour after we wrap. Um, and it's just over in the main space where we had the plenary the other day and yesterday as well. So um, be sure to go to that. And we've got some resources up here at the front table, um, including I have a few DVDs that I'd really love to not take home to Seattle. So, and I know we've got a bunch of cool stuff from Press Pass over there. Come and chat with us if you have any questions. And thank you guys so much for coming. Yeah.